You know, Darwin functions on many levels. Here's a guy proving that foundry explosions are a myth by pouring molten aluminium into water. You see, perfectly safe. Now for an encore, he's going to demonstrate that parking your stretch limo on the train tracks is perfectly safe. You see, perfectly safe. Still perfectly safe. Still, oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. Likewise, what can happen when you pour molten aluminium into water can be devastating. This control test shows the explosive potential. Molten aluminium is added to a small quantity of water in a quarter inch steel welded container. In the second test, the distance between the container and the water is reduced. The steel container is blown apart and the force of the blast would be enough to kill or severely injure workers and destroy a plant. And yes, I finally caved in and I bought a face mask to appease the safety crybabies on this channel. I should have bought a face mask for my camera instead because that aluminum went down way farther than I th Actually, I'm with the crybabies on this one. In fact, more than that, if I was doing this sort of stuff, pouring molten aluminum into water, I'd be taking it comparably seriously to the aluminum foundry people or Mythbusters here. Hot thermite is exploding. Now, I sort of have a problem with that because that requires that a whole bunch of- I've seen the power of the metal water explosion firsthand, and God, do I respect them. So it's essentially some potassium tied to the bottom of a shot glass, and that's gonna be dropped down that tube in the middle there, and then when it hits the water, it's gonna explode. I'm no stranger to dangerous chemistry here, and certainly knowing the risks can make doing things that seem insane to other people actually fairly safe. But the risk of insta-death here is quite real. These sorts of foundry explosions kill people on a semi-regular basis. Make no mistake about it, these people are alive by a simple roll of the dice. You live. Now we're talking. You all know this game, right? Oh, love it. Hey, Greenwood. What's the secret to good comedy? Timing. And what's courage? Grace under pressure. And who's the boss? The quarter inch thick steel plate is wrapped around itself like foil. The explosion barrier, made of railway sleepers reinforced with earth banking and two inch thick boards, is destroyed. You see, recently I put up a video busting an uh, aluminium battery, and in that I actually go through how there's actually a, a colossal amount of energy in aluminium. The true power in that aluminium can be devastating. It can do this to a factory. Another look at what used to be a casting plant. The blast and the fire that it caused lasted just a few minutes, but the effect was devastating. 
the entire factory building was gutted and the section which housed the furnace itself was reduced to a mass of twisted metal and ashes. You see, aluminium might look like it's got this really clean metallic surface, but it really doesn't. It's covered by this oxide layer. So you'll recall in my aluminium battery busted video, I actually had to clean off that oxide layer to get the full potential out of the metal. And that oxide layer stops the metal from reacting with oxygen or with water or coke or whatever. However, if you dissolve that oxide layer away, thrown into a, a solution, will get really quite hot. In fact, it'll get so toasty that it'll actually boil the water. All right, and this is just a little, a little bit of aluminium foil, 70. And that's incredible that you're generating that much heat whilst you're stuck in a glass at 40 degrees. 80, it's hot enough to burn you, 90. That's boiling the water at this point. That's actually to the point where it's just boiling the water. Let's take a look what it looks like with the camera. Likewise, when you heat aluminium up to melting point, it's still got that oxide layer on the surface. Indeed, if you do it with a little droplet, that oxide skin can be so thick that you can actually hold the metal drop up by it. Uh, here I've got an oxygen propane torch, which in, on paper goes up. It's actually oxygen propane, which will go up to about 3,000 degrees. I'm probably only going to go up just over one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a nice piece of aluminium. I hold it with my pliers like that, wait till it melts, then I'm going to heat it up to about a thousand degrees and dunk it in right in front of the high speed camera and we will see what we see. Okay. Get some oxygen in there. This will take it up to about a thousand. It's tricky, so there we go. Now I've, now I've got this thing molten. See how hot we can get it. So that white is one to one and a half thousand degrees. That's yeah, pretty hot. Okay, let's go. Cool, eh? So almost silent when it goes in at a thousand degrees. And I eventually dropped those aluminium droplets into water. And when I was doing that, I had the utmost respect for this, wearing a full face mask and the such like. Now, sure, I was only doing this with a single drop of aluminium. But if that explodes, it will throw molten aluminium around at about the speed of sound. It might only be a drop, but that's really not something you want. You see, aluminium water explosions release a comparable amount of energy to their weight in TNT. However, when I was doing this, I never actually got it to explode and was never willing to increase the amount of aluminium that I used. This was based mostly on my knowledge of the sodium water explosion and the knowledge that the aluminium water explosion releases a comparable amount of energy. Ooh. And just so we're clear on how violent and erratic this explosion can be, this was merely 350 milligrams of sodium. That's only about the size of an aspirin tablet. This time you missed the take. Uh, uh, yeah, I missed the take with both. Uh, normally we have this one and a little high speed camera going, but that is all that's left of our comical flask. That was only 350 milligrams as well. However, whilst doing the work on why sodium explodes with water, we realized fairly early on that there was a high random element to this. You know, sometimes it would just fizz around on the surface and other times it would explode in a devastating fashion. Now, eventually we worked out the explosion was very contingent on having a very clean metal surface contacting the water. And that's when we started using sodium potassium alloy because it's a liquid, you can handle it in syringes and you can get a very clean surface on it. And voila, it explodes essentially 100% of the time on contact with water when dropped from about one meter. Oh, I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad. 
which allowed us to film it at some 10,000 frames per second, where we could see that the metal was actually shooting fingers into the water, and that was happening within a tenth of a millisecond. Now, metal doesn't just accelerate into water on its own. There must be a force driving it. And maybe one of the most obvious ones, with hindsight, is a sort of coulombic explosion. It's also maybe worth noting that we did actually get this published in one of the world's top chemistry journals, Nature Chemistry. That is, five years ago, no one actually knew this. Making this, as far as I know, one of the few pieces of real research that started on YouTube and then made it into a top chemistry journal, while acknowledging those who had actually supported my channel in the paper itself. Now, aluminium is more or less doing the same thing here, and it's also probably the cause of the Mythbusters thermite ice explosion. And you can get a similar effect by putting some potassium on the end of a hammer and then hitting a block of ice with it. Cool. So all of these metal explosions release a comparable amount of energy to TNT when they really go off. In practice, this means that a hunk of aluminium about the size of a Mars bar will release about the same energy as a hand grenade. And that's not a happy place to be when it's at arm's length. So basically, what saved these people was their dirty working conditions. Aluminium forms this tenacious oxide skin very easily, and when it's done, it's very good at inhibiting this explosion. However, not perfect. You see, as you might expect, water in foundries unintentionally but inevitably can come into contact with a hot metal, as, say, for instance, in this wet mold in this iron pore. And this was merely a tier two, uh, a lesser explosion. The sort of thing that you get quite often if like here, you're pouring hot metal into wet molds. So here you can see the, the metal goes into the mold and immediately it starts boiling. There's water in there. And then it starts exploding all over the place to greater and lesser extents. But these are all small scale stuff. If it decides that it's going to go, it goes all at once. And as you can imagine, this is frequently fatal to people in foundries. You know, there's no imminent sign that something is wrong. And then it just explodes like this. Indeed, there are cases where people have gone up to the mold and tapped it with a hammer. Why would you tap a mold with a hammer? Well, apparently you do it to get the bubbles out such that you get nice, clean casting. And if there's any water in the mold when that's going on, what tends to happen is that cracks the oxide skin and you get the clean metal in contact with the water, which gives you the explosion. And in the back of my mind, I've got an itching suspicion that this is what blew up Chernobyl. You see, a lot of the core of the reactor is made up of zirconium because it's got good neutron properties for a reactor. But of course, once the reactor generates a huge amount of heat, some of that zirconium will melt. And when that goes into the water, you may well get something like this. Indeed, I actually put this idea forwards a few months back. And loads of people really like the idea of this research, and I got numerous offers of help. However, the real killer here is zirconium doesn't melt to almost 2,000 degrees, and it's exceptionally tough to put that much energy into a, a metal to get it to melt and then drop it into water in an oxygen-free atmosphere. You know, it's almost like the only thing that'll get that sort of power is a critical reactor. And not entirely true. You can put loads of electricity through it or induction heatings and the such like, but it's very difficult to do in the lab. You know, and thinking about it, maybe a good testing ground for this, a bridge project, is aluminium. Now, I really don't have the resources, the equipment, or the sheer lack of self-preservation to do research on this sort of scale. But then again, this really isn't that informative beyond telling you that you can get catastrophic explosions where the aluminium actually reacts with the water. What you need is something a little more informative, 
maybe something like we did with the sodium potassium alloy experiments. Apart from in the previous case, the alloy was liquid at room temperature, and here it's liquid at about 650 degrees Celsius. It's still quite a challenge to be able to do this though, in that that aluminium surface will react like crazy with both air and water vapor to give you an oxide layer that will inhibit the explosion. And you've got to drop it into water in roughly drop size proportions such that you don't blow up the apparatus without it building up that oxide layer. And then you've got to film it at some crazy film speed with a high speed camera. Can it be done? Well, I'll just leave you with a quote of Einstein on that one. We wouldn't call it research if we knew what we were doing. So if you enjoyed that, why not let yourself go and drop a like on this video. And if you want to see if this research actually goes somewhere, hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on new releases. And of course, if you really want to help this channel directly, you can subscribe to it on Patreon. And for those who are interested, the cameras that I used for a lot of the bridge level high speed filming here was a Sony RX Mark II and IV which provides a pretty versatile camera that'll film up to about a thousand frames per second. And if you like that sort of thing, links to my Amazon store below. And uh, thanks for watching.